Hello? This is he. Are you sure? Yeah, I'll be right there. I'm here to pick up Alden Call. Did you fill this form out? We'll notify you of a court date within 30 days. Dad, I know I messed up and I'm sorry. Come on, bud. Let's get you home. Those who know me well would make the case that I am somewhat impatient. And, and while I, and I hear the laughter, Lisa, and, and while I would not completely disagree, I would try to make the case that maybe I'm better than I was years ago. I'm, you know, a work in progress. We like to think that we're at least making progress. And, and I don't know about you, but I do know that, that waiting is not my favorite thing to do. Going to the doctor's office, I do not understand why we wait and we wait and we wait. Computer technology is way too good to not be able to better plan for how long an appointment's going to take. We ought not to have to wait so long. And I've heard people say they believe their blood pressure checks high when they get in there because they've been waiting so long. And I think they're probably right. Restaurants. Bless them. They can't find anybody to work right now. But my enjoyment of the meal decreases according to the amount of time I've had to wait to get a table. That's just kind of how it's always been. And then there's this retailing giant that we depend on. And, and you can actually pull in and they will bring your stuff out to you now. And, and if I've sat there long enough that I'm beginning to think in my mind I could have gone in, done the shopping, got my own stuff and been back in the truck... You know, then I'm on the phone trying to figure out what is going on right now. It should not take this long. And so uh, just a few of the things in life, and maybe you can identify, whether it's waiting for football season to finally arrive, whether it's uh, waiting for your week of vacation to finally get here, uh, whether it's waiting on the new season of the show that you like to binge to be uploaded to your favorite streaming service. You know, that new season's going to be here and we hate waiting on it. For most of us, we don't like to wait. And I begin there this morning to pose this question for all of us. What happens when we find ourselves having to wait on God? Because in our text today, Jesus, he, he's returning to Capernaum, uh, and he's going to, again, demonstrate his power by healing two women. Uh, the first occurs in public. But in the second, the healing's private, and for very good reason, because in the second healing, he's raising a 12-year-old girl from the dead. Both situations, both of them involve some waiting. And I want it to be noted here at the outset that the applications for us today related to this text that we're looking at, it is much more than about what we need to do when we become physically sick. And so again, today we're in Mark Chapter 5, verse 21, beginning. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered round him. And so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and upon seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come by and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. And so, is it significant that Jesus would be approached by a synagogue official? I believe that it is, and here's why. A synagogue, we're told, was ruled by a group of uh, very similar to elders in the way that they lead a congregation. A synagogue would have had a multiplicity of guys similar to that. Jairus was one of these guys who was leading a synagogue. Some commentators believe that a guy in the position Jairus is in, he would have wanted to keep a safe distance from Jesus. You think about much of Jewish leadership is opposed to Jesus, and so you, you got to be very careful about how you position yourself. The thought might have been, hey, let others go after Jesus. Let others get close to him. We'll see what this is about. If anything comes of it, we'll eventually know. Um, uh, some have summarized by saying he might have wanted to keep a very neutral position toward Jesus, yet his daughter's sick. 
And when people get sick and when people have needs, everything tends to change. And so uh, one guy said if Jairus had any prejudices toward Jesus, they were overshadowed by the need of his child. And we understand when our children are sick, when our children have needs, a lot of other things go out the window. Another said Jairus pockets his pride, forgets his fears, Why try to worry about religious controversy or political danger when your daughter is dying? And so he's got a very grave situation on his hands. And so in his desperation, he finds Jesus. He falls at the feet of Jesus. He's not worried about what people in the synagogue are going to think about him the next Sabbath when they gather. And what hope it must have created with him or within him when Jesus hears him and Jesus agrees to go with him and Jesus begins walking with him toward his home. But then surprise, surprise, Jesus gets interrupted and Jairus is going to have to wait. Notice verse 25 of the text. A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians, and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I touch his garments, I'll get well. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. She's been fighting a physical battle for 12 years. What were you doing 12 years ago? And then fast forward. I mean, she's been fighting the same battle all of this time. As a Jew, I have to believe she's been waiting on God to do something. Was she a woman of prayer? Probably so. She's been hoping. She's been searching. She's been trying everything humanly possible. She has spent all of her money allowing those in the medical field to try to help her. Uh, Everything they've tried hasn't worked. She's actually worse now than she was in the beginning. You know, sometimes today we can identify. Sometimes uh, medical technology just doesn't help. And, and we've tried and we've tried this and we've tried that and it's drained us financially and we're, we're not any better than we were. Sometimes we can identify with that. And it's worth noting that this medical problem of hers, it, it's, it's a big deal for more reasons than just whatever the physical problem itself is. According to the law, this woman would have been perpetually unclean. You can read about that in Leviticus 15, starting about verse 25, which means she is excluded and cut off from those who are around her because if she starts as an unclean person, if she starts interacting with folks, they become unclean also. So she's got to stay away from people. In fact, This woman's desperation has driven her to actually violate the law. And it's worth noting that that Jesus, in the interaction with her, he, he doesn't criticize her for this. And so after waiting, searching, hoping, praying, all of this for 12 years, in other words, waiting for God to do something, to still see see such great faith from her, it's significant. One scholar actually uses rescue language as he, as he translates her thought. If I can just touch his clothes, I'll be rescued. So possibly fearing the repercussions of Jesus knowing she's violated the law, she's likely hoping that Jesus isn't even going to know that she's come up behind him and touched him. I won't have bothered him. I won't have delayed him. Uh, I, ha- I won't have troubled him. And hopefully I won't get in trouble But see, that's not who Jesus is. Our Savior, our Lord, the one who went to the cross for us, he wants to be bothered. He wants to hear from us. He wants to serve. He wants to help. And so uh, in in the moment, imagine that joy of knowing immediately that you've been healed. But then in that moment of joy, also the dread when Jesus wheels around and begins asking questions. Verse 30, immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power Uh, proceeding from him has gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? You imagine a scene that the author that painted that, that, that's probably a lot what it looked like. People everywhere crowding around you. We've been in those kind of situations. And so for him to wheel around and to ask that question, it seems kind of ridiculous. 
I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Jesus, and, and think about Jairus. Now, Jairus and Jesus are going along, and Jesus, we got to keep you moving through this crowd. We've got to get you to my house. And then here's Jesus stopping and asking this ridiculous question, and Jairus is thinking, don't stop. We've got to get there. We can't stop for this. Notice verse 31. And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who'd done this, but the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. How long was the delay? Probably not long. We're not told. However, we do know that the delay is long enough that by the time Jesus gets to the home of Jairus, and there in Capernaum, it's not a large city, not a long, long walk, but by the time they get to the home of Jairus, the professional mourners have already arrived to mourn the death of this daughter. The text does say that the woman tells Jesus her story. She tells him the whole truth. That may have taken some time. But I love Jesus' response in verse 34. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has rescued you. Her faith, His power. And to me, it's impressive to see such faith after 12 long years of waiting, of searching, of hoping, of trying everything you know to try. And it's also been suggested that when Jesus says, go in peace, that that may well have mean that healing was also given to her soul. In other words, she was made whole both physically and spiritually. But remember, you've still got Jairus over here checking his watch. Uh, he's in a hurry. Jesus, we've got to get you there. We didn't have time for this delay. And so then we get to verse 35. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. So you imagine being told don't be afraid, only believe, but you're sitting there knowing that your daughter has already died. She's already passed from this life. Jesus is making a big ask right here. He wants Jairus to embrace faith rather than fear before his circumstances have actually changed. His circumstances still are, my daughter right now is dead, and Jesus is asking him to embrace faith rather than fear. We're introduced here also to the professional mourners. It says in verse 38, they came to the house of the synagogue official and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing and entering in. He said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. In Judaism, there were well-established procedures for the grieving process, and professional mourners were a, a part of that. They came, and their purpose was to be loud and to wail and, and to make it possible for members of the person's family to give vent to their own uh, feelings and hurts without restraint. And so the professional mourners were actually there as a service to those who were bereaved, and maybe the Jews were ahead of the game on that one. We know today that bottling up grief is extremely unhealthy. And so they, were, they try to make it possible for people to grieve. But these mourners, they don't like what Jesus says, or at least they think it's pretty funny. It says in verse 40, they began laughing at him, but, but, but putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was, Jesus and just five other people, Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given to her to eat. 
Well, of course this is laughable to them. This is the first time Mark records Jesus raising someone from the dead. That's why all five witnesses to this, the girl's father and mother, Peter, James, John, they're all astounded. Why the don't tell command? Well, that brings us back to this messianic secret thing that we talked about early in our study of Mark. Jewish leadership doesn't yet need to know that Jesus is raising people from the dead. It might lead to the death of Jesus before his time, before all things are accomplished. And so he doesn't want this told. And it occurs to me that he puts Jairus in a very interesting position. Because this is the kind of story you're going to want to tell. Nobody's going to have to beg you to talk about the guy that came and raised your daughter from the dead. And yet Jesus says, hey, don't tell this story just yet. In days ahead, when other Jewish leaders are going to criticize Jesus and mock Jesus and talk about how Jesus is this fraud, what do you think Jairus is going to want to do? He's going to stand up and say, well, you can say what you want about Jesus, but Jesus came into my home and raised my daughter from the dead. I wonder how many times Jairus had to bite his tongue in days ahead. I wonder how many times he told this story after the cross, after Jesus had gone, been crucified and been raised again. What a powerful way to confirm the identity of Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior, the one the Jews have been looking for, the one where most of them would miss the point. Obviously, similar to the Legion guy that we talked about last week, today's text includes, it's, it's two more stories of Jesus confirming the power behind his word by giving people back their lives. For the woman who'd battled that issue of blood for 12 years, physical healing made it possible for her to return to a normal life in society. For the 12-year-old girl, physical life was returned to her dead body. Her life literally was given back to her. Yet, and I know you understand this, the big ideas regarding this text, they're, they're not primarily about what we need to do when we get sick physically. So how does this or how should this text impact us today? Think about two key learnings. Number one, faith should always win out over fear, no matter how much waiting is involved. You imagine the frustration 12 years of attempting to fix, to fix what is in your eyes your most significant problem. But then the faith to, to get to Jesus, the faith to get in front of him being stronger than your fear of violating the law, stronger than your fear of getting in some kind of trouble. And then you imagine the tension. You've set your fears aside. You may have put your job on the line as a synagogue official getting to Jesus, but you're doing that because the life of your daughter's on the line. And then you're interrupted, and you have to wait, and you think you've lost your daughter. One guy said, Jairus put the interruption under the control of Jesus, but how do we handle similar difficulties like the one Jairus faced? How do we handle waiting on God today? And what are some of the things that we wait on? You know, perhaps there is a health issue with you or someone whom you care about and you've been pleading with God to intervene. That is one kind of waiting that we sometimes do. Maybe you've been waiting on a career door to open in your life. Perhaps you're waiting on a relationship that you highly value, a relationship that needs to be mended, and you're wondering when things are going to transpire so that that relationship can be fixed. Maybe you're waiting on someone uh, to come along that you can marry, that you can spend the rest of your life with, someone to come along who will help you get to heaven, and maybe you're beginning to wonder if that's ever going to happen. Maybe you're waiting on someone whom you care about deeply to get right with God, maybe a spouse, maybe a child, maybe a parent. And see, we have faith that, that God still works in people's lives. Our fear is that time may run out. Timing is a major concern for us. 
And it's normal for there, from our standpoint for there to be a sense of urgency because from our perspective, when, when we're needing God to do something, time is of the essence. And, and it's scriptural. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 36, Jesus talking about, uh, we don't know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man's going to return. God alone knows that. So there's this deadline out there. We don't know what it is. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul writes about this idea too, that we need to redeem or make the best use of time. Time, we value it highly. And the problem with waiting is that waiting can, can lead to doubt. Will that health issue ever get better? Will that job opening ever come along? Will that relationship ever resolve? Will that right person ever come along? Uh, does God, will that person ever uh, choose to humble themselves and obey the gospel? Does God really even care when, when he's got to know that these things are so important to me? Doubt can lead to shattered faith. Bad decision making, running ahead of God. Tonight we're going to look at running ahead of God in our study of Abraham and, and Sarah and Hagar. We'll be talking about that tonight. And so the question becomes, do our lives reflect a confidence in the power of God no matter what the current circumstance is? Remember, Jesus called Jairus to have faith before his circumstances ever actually changed. Key learning number two, active faith seeks Jesus as a first priority rather than as a last resort. When we have things come up in our lives, do we try everything else first or do we put it at the feet of Jesus first? Which is first for us? Good people in, in our text sought Jesus when they were desperate, and that was appropriate. We don't know how long Jairus' daughter, we don't know how long she'd been sick. We know that Jairus had figured out that Jesus was likely uh, his only option, his only possibility for helping his daughter. After all, he probably doesn't take this risk otherwise. For the woman with the issue of blood, we know Jesus was her last resort. She'd been fighting this issue multiple times longer than Jesus' public ministry had been going on. But one of the reminders for us, like we sang about this morning, should be that we're always seeking Jesus first. Because when we obey the gospel, that day you're baptized into Christ from the mission of your sins, that fixes, that corrects your most important problem. Jesus on that day, he saves your soul. He saves mine. Many of us in the room, we've done that. Most of us in the room, we've done that. If you haven't, I pray you won't delay another day. But the truth is, once your salvation is secure, all of the other problems that come up in life at least in one sense, should be seen as secondary. When you're a Christian, all these other things ought to be less distracting, less likely to cause doubt because of the knowledge that Jesus has saved your soul. There is good news. Should you not be a Christian today and, and should you be delaying and surrendering your life to Him, He's still going to be there ready to save provided time doesn't run out while you're pursuing other interests. The power of Jesus, it was clear. It was undeniable for any person who would look at the evidence in an unbiased way. And as such, both Jairus and, and the sick woman, they approached Jesus in a somewhat daring sort of way. Jairus falling at the feet of Jesus. This woman, without regard for what the law says, coming up behind him, touching him, finding healing from him. You may be realizing today, if you're outside of Christ, if you've not given your life to Christ yet, you may realize that to do so would be a bit of a daring act on your part. Or maybe it was a daring act on your part when you obeyed the gospel. Maybe you were the first person in your family to regularly go to church. Maybe you were the first person in your family to surrender your life to Christ. Maybe you were the first person in your family and, and maybe you actually had to explain to your family why you were walking away from the non-biblical idea of denominationalism. I would love to know what that 12-year-old did with the rest of her life. 
I would love to know what that woman with the 12-year hemorrhage did with the rest of her life. I wonder how many times after that they told their respective stories. I wonder how many times Jairus told his Jesus story after the cross, after the resurrection. I wonder what the focal point of their lives was from that day forward. Martel Pace said, no man is as fearless as the one who lives in deep faith. And really, when you boil it all down, I believe that ought to be the goal for all of us. When we think about this text, a deep and abiding faith, that's what we need to possess. Is the life you're living today characterized by deep faith? Or are you still allowing fears to control you? Because it is powerful when, when a Christian, when a child of God receives news that they don't like, they receive news they wouldn't have preferred, but they respond from a position of deep faith. The conversation this week was with someone who got news they didn't want, news they didn't like. And, and it's one of those where waiting's going to be involved, testing, not knowing how much time's going to be available. And oh, for all of us to be able to respond this way, if this can't be treated, I'm ready to go. And if it can be treated, I'm going to be joyful and I'm going to continue to enjoy my time here. And then the statement was made, you know, the tough thing is knowing that it's going to make so many people sad to know that I'm not, that I'm sick. See, that's the blessing of making Jesus a priority, a first priority, making him the focal point of your life rather than going to him as a last resort. That's what faith over fear looks like. Is that the kind of faith you have today? If not, why not? Because the power of Jesus can restore you to real life today. If you're here and not a Christian, if you're outside of Christ, if you're ready to be baptized for the mission of your sins, we would love to assist you in that. If your walk with God as a Christian isn't what it ought to be, our shepherds today are ready to pray with you and for you. If you have a need today, please let it be known while we stand and while we sing. Hello, my name is Philip Goad, and I'm privileged to serve as the minister here at North Highlands Church of Christ. You may have heard something in today's message that has you asking some questions, wanting to know more about God's Word, and we would be thrilled for the opportunity to study God's Word with you. If you'll reach out to us, we'll be happy to set up a Bible study with you. We'd also invite you to come out and connect with us, worship with us in person. Worship services Sundays are at 9.30 a.m., followed by Bible classes for all ages at 10.45. We also have a midweek Bible study that begins at 6.30 p.m., you can also connect with us via our Facebook page, and that has served many well during the pandemic when they did not feel safe in getting out. On the third Saturday of each month, we have a food bank that's open from 9 to 11 a.m. It is serving Franklin County, and so if you know of anyone who would benefit from uh, coming by to pick up food on the third Saturday, please let them know about this opportunity. It is one of the ways that we serve our community. Again, thank you for watching today. And I hope to connect with you very soon.